Recording in the story. Should focus on whatever you say. Shall we start? Yeah. Anna, shall we start? Yeah. Is it recording and excellent, fantastic. Great. Well, um, it's a very great pleasure to welcome you all, both here at King's and also online. My name is uh, Matt Spurdal, and I'm a professor in the Department of War Studies. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to be able to chair this seminar and book launch. Um, it's lovely to be able to introduce Sukanya Pode, who is, as you will know, a reader here at King's, a reader in post-war reconstruction and peace building. And of course, equally great pleasure to welcome uh, my old friend. We don't meet, we only meet on these kinds of occasions, uh, <laughs> so thank you very much for, for doing this. I know just how busy you are. Uh, I won't say very much. I had the pleasure and the honor of chairing this, so I might say something a little bit later, but I do want to flag, if I may, the importance of this particular book. Um, I was reading it uh, last week and again today, and I think it, it, it genuinely is one of those books that fills a very important gap in the literature. I mean, I think a great deal of the work on peace building over the past you know, 10, 15 years has been to demonstrate how uh, what we often now refer to as technocratic approach to peace building is not very effective and indeed often produces perverse and unintended consequences. So initially, when I picked up this book, I thought perhaps this is what uh, Sukanya is going to do just to reinforce that message. And to some extent, she does. But also, importantly, I think you try to, to show um, how we can actually get away from this impasse of saying that technocratic peacekeeping doesn't work. Where do we go from here? And I was very struck by your central argument, which is the immense, and I quote, transformative potential at the heart of also technocratic peace building. And I think that's of particular interest, I think, for, for not just for policymakers, but also for academics. And we are where we are with respect to the legacies of peace uh, building, but how do we move from here? And even within the context of, of a sort of technocratic model, we can move forward. The other, I think, very important uh, contribution you make here is really to think about the long-term legacies of, of peace building. And that is inherently going to be very, very difficult. And because it's so difficult, few people have really done it systematically. And you tend to fall back, as policymakers often do, on the kind of short-term wins involved in, 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 in peace building exercises. And I think you've not just demonstrated with respect to, to case studies, but also given us a framework for thinking about what those long-term legacies might be, both in terms of norms, what do we actually communicate, what do we transmit over time, uh, in terms of the institutional and organizational legacies. And I think that's enormously important and helpful for thinking about it. And third, but not least, of course, you have a very explicit focus on on children and young people. And that's, I suppose, a little bit poignant as we watch the horrific scenes today of the war in Ukraine. And of course, it is the intergenerational dimension of this we've got to think more about than we've done in the past. And I think your book does an important contribution to that as well. And the great thing about having Funmi here is that I know in addition to you know, all the other important work she does, this is something which you've had a long standing interest in yourself, not least the whole issue of, of children, youth, and peace building. So we have a, a stellar combination of uh, speakers here. So I won't say anything more, but the floor is yours. So actually, I should say something about the running of things. Let me just say this. Those who are joining us on Zoom, if you have questions, which I hope you will, and I'm sure you will have, please um, send them to Anna, or just put them in the box, and we'll, we'll respond to them that way. And then those who are here, please join us afterwards for a bit of lots of wine, as it turns out now, because we're not, you know, we're not 60, we're good with numbers still, and some food afterwards, and we can continue the discussion then. Okay, floor is yours. Thank you, Matt. Uh, 
And for me for being here, I think this is a great pleasure to celebrate um, not only this book, but also the kind of work we do over so many years. And this book is a pure labor of love. It's taken a very long time and I'm immensely happy and grateful to be able to share my findings, but also just generally some of the reflections in terms of this research. So thank you for coming everybody and also those who are online. Uh, I have a little bit of a presentation because I thought it was easier to communicate the arguments. Um, Professor Bardal here had written a book a few years back about building peace after war. And it's important because we are faced with a fundamental challenge of so many people, nearly more than 2 billion, who live in countries which are affected by conflict. And therefore conflict prevention efforts, peace building efforts are significant areas of international engagement, whether it's by donors, uh, billions of dollars have been invested by the United Nations, by various donor governments in the name of peace building. Yet we don't really know very much or we know very little, let's say, if this money is being well spent beyond short-term monitoring and evaluation outputs of various projects. And this is in some ways a motivation, the puzzle, you know, which made me write this because 15 years I've spent in different countries, whether it's um, Liberia, in West Africa, South Sudan, um, in Mindanao, in various conflict affected countries, working with children and young people, both as a academic researcher, but also as a consultant to a range of governmental, intergovernmental, non-governmental organizations. And this kind of deep engagement, practical engagement, kind of made me think and reflect on what happens to the beneficiaries, to the participants of various peace building projects, years after these projects have folded up, and also what sort of learning and reflection happens on part of or does not, on part of various donors, who fund and sponsor these programs, not to mention the various NGOs, which uh, you know, implement these programs. So this is sort of the puzzle. We started way back in 2007, eight, when I was in Liberia doing field work. Now, we really, it's, it's kind of important here to, sorry, this, I have not been moving this clearly. It's, it's sort of important to think about some of the reality checks with these buildings. When you think about peace building in terms of the real work or what, how it unfolds, it's a very dynamic process. It's gradual, it's incremental, it's evolutionary, it's long-term. But the way that we do the work of peace building is time bound. It's tied to various kinds of objectives that donors set. And the effectiveness of peace building, which is a really big debate in the field, is tied to these short-term monitoring and evaluation tools in terms of you know, how did you deliver? What are the outputs that you delivered from various projects? So in a sense, there is no ability to pause, to think, to reflect on the long-term, or we don't even have the methodological tools for long-term evaluation, right? So what that means is um, very little longitudinal research, very little follow-up research happens with various project participants years after these projects close, and many, many NGOs are in country for 10, 15 years, and we kind of lose that kind of um, archival data that is produced during the life cycle of various projects. And therefore, when we turn the lens to understanding peace building legacy, you know, by peace building legacy, how I conceptualize it, I look at long term effects of 10 to 15 years of various interventions that are being attempted, let's say by NGOs. And I worked in partnership with a particular NGO and I'll talk about it in a little bit. But in terms of conceptualizing, there were three lens that I used. One was time, the other was transformation, and the third was intergenerational peace. And then also in terms of measurement, there were three qualitative cues, uh, normative, organizational, institutional logics, which I will talk about shortly. Now, what do I mean by time? Again, reiterating that for policymakers and donors, it's all about policy time, bureaucratic lock time, time bound projects, financial accountability. And so much of the work of peace building is about performance or showing or doing. And it's about outputs, it's about activities, it's about this busyness and tick box learning. And when I say transformation, you know, inherently conflict transformation is a long drawn process, but peace building is tied to this time bound you know, essence of projects. Therefore, there's a fundamental misalignment when it comes to how we fund 
uh, the objectives around building peace and how we seek accountability for the money that is being spent, but the methodological tools in terms of capturing the long-term changes do not exist. And therefore, in effect, what we are trying is we're aspiring through peace building to bring about this transformation in young people or you know, people's lives in these countries affected by conflict. But what we are, the way that we are delivering it is very much time-bound technical activity, which is rooted in short-term impact. So the other point here, and you know, I, I develop intergenerational peace as a new project with the HRC next year in Indonesia. I've been really fortunate. But very few people think about conflicts in terms of generational experiences. And they are. If you think about Palestine, Kashmir, South Sudan, all these conflicts have been going on for decades. And the different generations have different experiences of conflicts. And therefore, when you're trying to build peace, the generational needs are different. And very often, peace building does not address the intergenerational lens when it comes to the different needs of different generations. And I think that is a really important area that, that I want to come back to. Now, in terms of methodological choices, obviously, how do I go about doing this? Because it wasn't quite possible to have all this data. So I went into a knowledge production partnership with a large peace building organization, multi-country, and I did field work in two countries, Sierra Leone and North Macedonia, but I also worked with their institutional learning teams in the headquarters in Washington, DC, and also in the field, the various regional uh, headquarters, and of course, the two countries. Now, this is one of the things I want to share with students who are here. In terms of longitudinal data, there's this huge amount of resource from the evaluations, from the archives of institutional memory, internal communications. Not every peace building organization is willing to share, but if they are, this is this incredible mine of information that you can dig into. And I was very fortunate to have access to this because I could look at the various theories of change. I could look at the various projects, what they were delivering, what sort of norms they were transmitting. So this was one of the approaches I took and I used the meta-ethnographic meta model to kind of framework to analyze this data. Now, one of the things I look at is also about non-transmission. Non um, that's is referred to it quickly, but the values that are being transmitted through various projects, you know, how far they resonate with the beneficiaries, you know, what happens in terms of how they behave over the long term, their families, and how far they resonate, particularly with the local values. You know, this local turn in peace building, we talk a lot, a lot about it, but we don't really think about the re resonance and re retention of norms. The third angle is about institutionalization and adaptation. Here it's about how far is there thinking in terms of actually succession models, right? So you have these projects, you may have short-term benefits from these projects, but how far is the learning and the benefit then transferred to national governments or to various NGOs, is there any handover and succession? This was quite an important puzzle to look at. So in terms of conceptualizing peace building legacy, these were the various uh, areas that I looked at. The next bit is the case studies, and I will quickly talk about the two case studies in North Macedonia. You know, those who are familiar with the Balkans will know that the issue is about intergroup um, conflict. It's also about language equality. And in this case, the NGO that I work with, the large INGO, they were using peace education and media and theater. As part of the field work, I get to go to really lovely places. This is like over it, by the way. Um, so in, you know, I was working with these kindergartens. The focus was on intercultural communication between Macedonians and Albanians. And peace education is a really important growing field of activity in terms of um, peace building. And uh, it was interesting to see what sort of norms were being transmitted through intercultural communication projects. These uh, kindergartens where you had Albanian teachers and you had uh, Macedonian teachers, and they were um, trying to transmit these languages to young children between three to six years of age. So in, in deeply divided societies, obviously language is a very important issue. The other thing here is you know, these kindergartens that I visited in Macedonia. So there were not many, but it was a very interesting model in terms of the normative push from the European Union on bilingual instruction on intercultural communication. 
And the interesting bit is this mosaic model, which is the kindergarten, uh, you know, they're called mosaic uh, kindergartens. This has been adopted by the government um, at, at a particular time. And this kind of nationalization or institutionalization of a peace building project is rare. And in some ways, peace education actually enables this kind of uh, institutionalization more than media projects, which is what we'll see shortly. Um, but the mosaic model, you know, I, I don't want to transmit this idea that it was perfect. There were many difficulties or funding difficulties when it was institutionalized. You know, a lot of the frills went because donors were paying more money, but the government could not afford it. And when the frills went, you know, it meant that the experience for children and their families was not quite the same. In effect, the kindergartens were very popular because they were the sort of best alternative in terms of preschool education, not so much in terms of intercultural communications. Although the norms transmitted or being emphasized was to bring these two communities closer and to expose them to the values uh, and, and the language uh, you know, of the two communities. But in reality, it was very practical reasons why children were being enrolled into these uh, mosaic kindergartens. So in, in just to summarize, what did I find in Macedonia? I found that um, the, in terms of learning and reflection, I want to start with that. The institutional memory was very well preserved. You know, there was a lot of staff continuity. Um, alumni, not quite, they didn't quite follow up as much. Learning was quite weak because there was so much emphasis on projects and activities and often repetition of activities. There was not enough inter-organizational learning with other organizations like UNICEF and Nansen Dialogue Center, which were running similar intercultural communication projects, but also not enough follow-up with alumni. They started quite late in the life cycle of the Mosaic projects. And uh, often the theory of change was not being revisited despite various evaluations asking for the fact that instead of individual children, it was the family which needed to be the focus of these um, programs because the family and social capital elements were really important in the context of Macedonian society. And therefore, I found that geographic location, pre-existing social ties between the two groups, the relationship between families was quite a powerful um, sort of uh, determinant of how far these norms in terms of intercultural communication actually held. And institutionalization of already mentioned that although it was institutionalized, it was not a seamless process. You know, there were many difficulties with translating a model and often there was dilution in terms of quality. And one of the things is that there was never any interrogation as to how far the normative portion intercultural communication. And it was a very donor driven project, but it was not really enough internal reflection or understanding that whether it resonated with society, whether society was ready for this kind of uh, you know, closeness between the groups, it was very superficial in terms of norm transmission and retention. Okay, uh, Sierra Leone, this has been in Sinjo in Pujahun district. I know Food Me's done a lot of work in Sierra Leone. Um, the focus was on media programs on attitude change through radio. And it's, it's interesting because I've done so much work in West Africa and always I used to see these radio programs and how people used to listen to these programs when they were in, in the communities. Very little research, however, has gone into thinking about the long-term effects of community radio, for example. This was an interesting area to dig into. And I found that very much media, you know, adopts a programming for change approach. They're trying to change beliefs and attitudes through behavior change communication. Now, these obviously are various levels of individuals, groups, and structural change. But how far this acceptance or internalization or retention of these media content, I think this was an important puzzle to uh, pursue. This is the timeline of the various radio programs that the studio I was working with had run. It was quite famous. You know, It had become a model in terms of various local community radio stations. There's a lot more in the book, and it's just so difficult to translate so many years of work. Um, but it was interesting because it gives us a focus on the various topics that were being discussed, uh, the norms that were, were being discussed. In brief, you know, the things that I found is that immediately after the war, the programs resonated very much with the local context. And in some ways, the bigger lesson here is that after the war, there's a greater scope 
it's, it's a nebulous situation. There's a greater scope for original, authentic programming. As time goes by, donor conditionality, donor interest, donor agendas become that much more structured. And there is not enough scope to be authentic to the local needs and local norms. This was a very interesting finding. And also in Sierra Leone, there was a big focus on intergenerational issues you know, because of the nature of the conflict. But often these were exacerbated um, because of the norms around rights. There was instrumental adop adoption of these uh, norms around children's rights, uh, women's participation, for example. But the elders in a gerontocratic society were quite resistant to this change in power dynamics. Uh, also in terms of institutionalization, unlike in Macedonia with the peace education projects, with media projects, you know, the norms were, it was, it was very difficult to track over the long term in terms of retention because of the dispersed nature of, of media. You know, you can have attitude uh, surveys and things like that. It was very difficult to look at the long-term change, the behavior change. The other point was that often there was very little link with the government departments. So institutionalization wasn't really built into the thinking of these programs. The other thing is that um, there was a tendency to prolong country presence on part of the Sierra Leone country office. And there's a big chapter on learning and reflection. That planning exits early, planning exits in a way that there's a succession plan, that you know, there are national organizations taking over the work that is often quite effective over many years, and we don't have that in place which means that all this work, all this effort, all this uh, you know, effort to change and transmit norms and sensitize to various issues disappears and particularly ad hoc structures, whether it's child welfare committees, whether it's these women's groups, there's no real thinking into livelihoods or employment generation that the national government continues after the NGOs exit. And the other point is that often these ad hoc structures live or they're, they're alive as long as uh, the project funding um, is there. And the moment the funding is withdrawn, people just go back to doing their own thing or what, what they know. So often there are missed opportunities along the way. And I think it's important for us to reflect on these issues in terms of institutionalization, in terms of learning and reflection. Um, so I have this big chapter on norm transmission. And in, in brief, I think the issue of resonance the issue of how far local societies are willing and open to adopting some of these liberal norms or liberal remedies that have been attempted. In Sierra Leone, there was greater openness compared to Macedonia. It was very much national push, a political push to get into NATO and EU, which has transpired in all these intercultural communication projects because these are conditions being set by external donors. In Sierra Leone, actually, there was more instrumental adoption of norms, norms that helped marginalized groups, whether it's women, whether it's youth, whether it's children, in terms of rights, in terms of um, greater participation, you know, political participation, accountability, governance. So it's, it's a fascinating mosaic of how norms interacted with these programs and what was adopted and how resonance really mattered and created better retention. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about institutionalization succession and learning and reflection, I think. Having formal links with the national governments can really help various civil society organizations you know, who are working in the peace building field. And it creates a stronger legacy, both during the lifetime of the project, of these projects that they attend and also later. And less is more. And I think we need to remember that in our everyday day, that it's, it's important to focus on a few things and do it well, rather than stretch your you know, interests into so many areas because there's donor money to be chased which means that often you have these multiple years of programming in, same, in the same uh, sort of focus area. In Sierra Leone, for example, electoral violence and democratization, this area was a great success. And it was a great success because you know, there were multiple years of you know, effort being put into this. So having these uh, you know, ad hoc programs, which last only nine to 12 months, um, which, where there's no follow-up, where there's no consistency. It does not, you know, it's like a drop in the ocean effect. It does not result in strong legacies. And also follow-up research and having these succession um, things in place. Follow-up research with beneficiaries trying to really understand how things changed. And now there's actually a push 
within various organizations to do post exit studies. And I think that's a really important thing to follow up. Uh, with learning and reflection, I think for various organizations which are doing peace building work, actively archiving the institutional memory, you know, documenting the communications, the evaluative evidence, um, maintaining staff continuity, I think is really important and continuity with programmatic focus. Planning exits early because there's invariably a you know, tendency to prolong presence because there's money to be had from the donors. And that doesn't really work. The local re residents of various projects. And finally, I think learning is a condition of various you know, accountability requirements of donors. Learning is a condition uh, linked to monitoring and evaluation. That is, again, an accountability requirement from for various species building projects. But very rarely is it internally guided. And I think for various peace building organizations, practitioners, learning should be a really internally guided and moral compass of what can we learn from the work that we're doing, right? And I think that is a really important area to focus on for people who want to go away and work in the peace building field. And finally, very few, you know, there was very limited evidence of revisiting the theories of change for these projects and making adjustments. But it's really important if you want to leave a long-term legacy, if you want to, you know, do something meaningful in terms of changing people's attitudes from violence to peace. And that's where I leave it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Brilliant. For me, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just first and foremost uh, congratulate Sukanya. I know that indeed this has been a labor of love for you. Uh, you spent a lot of time actually putting, you know, reflecting uh, both intellectually and, and practically on the experiences you had all through those years and then uh, really also leveraging the research that you've done. Before I go further, let me acknowledge the fact that we have quite a number of this of people in this room from the African Leadership Center, not just staff or fellows who just who are quite recent here, uh, who themselves have lived through war. South Sudan, I can acknowledge South Sudan in the room. Um, I don't know if any of the West Africans uh, is here. People from Z Zimbabwe as well. Um, and I, I think it will be good to get the reflection on some of this. Some of you were quite young too when the wars in your country started. And so it's part of the beauty of being in an academic environment where you see researcher practitioner networks try to reflect on the realities that you all went through. So I want to acknowledge that and it will be good to have uh, your feedback in question time. I, I, I think what Sukanya's book um, has done and I've tried to go through um, in the have not done in depth reading since you left it for me two weeks ago, but I managed to cover a couple of chapters that uh, helped me in preparation for today. And the number of points that I want to make uh, about how, in terms of how I reflect uh, from my own experience. In 2008, I, I think you begin uh, with a narration of what, you know, of your time in Liberia in 2008. In 2008, I was just completing my own reflection, my, you know, my learnings from, of the UN mission in, in Sierra Leone. And I see some of the, you know, uh, some very interesting factors in the way that, you know, in some of the issues you engage in this book. And so what I would like to do is offer some reflections because I now cast my mind back. I, I was at the United Nations, uh, interestingly, between 1999 and 2003, 1999, was a very special moment in, in the crisis in West Africa. That's when we had the cross-border um, impact of peacekeeping and the UN Security Council itself was uh, reflecting iteratively on how to respond to those conflict environments. In Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, later on Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Bissau even before Cote d'Ivoire. And the question of young people uh, has been a perennial issue. And so the kind of lessons learning you've done here takes us full circle. Uh, you, you've managed to close the circle in a way that you've brought us back. You've taken us to the future of all of those things to actually truly reflect on what does this mean for how we think about 
uh, peace building today and actually about the legacies um, in terms of how we deal in real time during conflict with, um, with the, the question of either the involvement or the impact of those wars on, long pe on young people and over time on what happens to that intergenerational relationship and of course what happens to the young who have grown, right? So, so, so first and foremost, methodologically, you, 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 know, you defined for us, I, I think you grappled with the question of who actually counts as youth, who's young, who are you dealing with at that point in time? It's exactly what we try to, uh, to deal with because as, as we reflected on the immediate issues at the core of, of peace building at the time, how we defined youth, uh, and, you know, determined whether or not um, we were successful or effective or not, even on the ground. By the way, I worked in the office of the UN Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children Affected by Armed Conflicts at the time. And in terms of policy and advocacy, it was really harrowing at times to reflect on exactly these questions. And I can just now think back um, almost two decades, I mean, more than two decades afterwards uh, to some of the things we got right or wrong. And so if you just took a definition of international labor organization and said it's 15 to 24, or you took a definition of UNICEF, even UNICEF that was our counterpart that only saw under 18s as children and over 18s as youth, whether you talked about immediate intervention or the fact that you were trying to bridge the gaps in demobilization, this growing issue was a perennial problem. If you didn't capture the 15 year olds and you offered a program, you know, and you didn't capture 15 to 18, 17 year olds as adults, as young adults, as youth, and you capture them as children, you failed woefully because many re remained, uh, you know, arms bearing and the kind of educational provisions you made for them might impact them. So we never really got certain things right on questions of. Uh, the International Criminal, uh, in the, the Statute of the International Criminal Court in Sierra Leone. Again, who bore responsibility, who didn't? All of those things were, you know, things that affected that looking back, you began to see uh, the norms we set uh, on the question of, you know, young people themselves. Those norms re have impacted uh, what we did and have had implications for legacy. But I want to go back to the question of, uh, the templated approach. And that is one of the things when I look now at the non-UN actors, especially the kinds of organizations and agencies and the programs that you were looking at, it makes me wonder whether there were things that we templated even in non-governmental agencies, within non-governmental agencies, when you look at Macedonia, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and other places. How easy is it to transfer uh, those things? And yet, uh, as I look at your own methodology, your careful, the systematic way in, you, uh, in which you look at all of this, I think there's a lot of value in taking on the learnings from here. And these learnings themselves, and I don't know who you might have been dealing with at the United Nations, um, the cross-fertilization between non-governmental entities and the United Nations will become a big area uh, of learning as we go along. But I want to return to the evolution of youth involvement on this intergenerational questions. When you, when you begin to look, and I reflect now seeing your work, what happened to those young people who benefited from such projects compared to young people who were not defined as young, as youth, who didn't benefit from such projects? Can we see a particular pattern as we look at those lessons two, two decades later? And then anecdotally, if I think back to Sierra Leone, which is where I was you know, completing that study and where uh, the work of our own office at the time, uh, where uh, Sierra Leone was flagship for the work of that office at the time, I can think of a certain number of young people who benefited from programs of non-governmental organizations or UN agencies, and they themselves have become uh, parts of peace building entities today running peace building, uh, peace building programs, either 
in the neighborhood or in Afghanistan in different places, working for non-governmental organizations. And you can compare them anecdotally to young people who were part, who missed out of either DDR programs or education programs and have become, uh, have are lost somewhere in that limbo, have, you know, have been in limbo for a long time. And you actually cannot see the kind of um, uh, contribution that they have made to society. There is no systematic st study of such things. And perhaps uh, Sukanya, part of the, uh, part of the next generation of research that we need to do is to dig deep and begin to see uh, these aspects. But talking about intergenerational um, learning, which I quite appreciate, I think Sierra Leone itself offers a reflection about how young people, having been through those programs or not, begin to develop their own voice around this thing you call the instrumentalization of, of the new liberal norms that are deposited in, in the peace building, through the peace building missions. And actually for good or bad, you can look at how Sierra Leone has had successive elections adapting uh, these norms. You can look at Liberia, how it has successfully adapted those norms. You can see how South Sudan has not done well, um, really it's struggling to adapt those norms. And whether it will ever do so is another thing entirely. Uh, the jury is out on the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, you can look at other places mm -hmm. and begin to make those comparisons. But what you begin to see is how youth voices in Sierra Leone, for example, uh, the youth bulge was not, it was not the place that, you know, had its, its youth bulge moment had not come as of the time that um, all of this was going on. At this point now, you now have the youth bulge. Sierra Leone is actively undergoing a youth bulge uh, in a sense. But that youth voice drove a change of government uh, mm -hmm. a couple of elections ago. And you can begin to see how in the area of music, I love what you were saying, I think is the talking drum, drum studios of the search for common ground you were talking about in Sierra Leone, how community radio, how music, how youth culture uh, began, you know, to really help us change that environment. And I think you already referenced already. I saw that you referenced the work of uh, Ibrahim Abdullah, uh, Ismail Rashid, uh, those who actually worked actively to really begin to translate uh, what it means to be youth and the voices of youth. Uh, Abdallah's work initially on push, push back to, uh, to destruction led us to understand really the youth culture dynamics in what was going on in Sierra Leone. All of that has been transformed into something really, really useful. And I want to congratulate you uh, on doing such uh, a fantastic job documenting this systematically and giving us a framework within which we can begin to see peace building through uh, the lens of legacy, uh, but legacy both in terms of the impact of the initiatives um, and projects that were, that were run as part of the response to a problem a decade, two decades, if not three ago, but also legacy in terms of the young people who evolve over time and grow to make impact or not. And I think that is where you know, we're beginning to take the peace building agenda to. I want to thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you very, very much to both of you. Um, we'll open up for, for questions. Um, I will keep an eye out, uh, and if there are anyone uh, on your online. Um, but if I can just uh, perhaps, if I may, if I can start, just abuse the privilege of, of, chair, of chairing the session. Um, just, just one, one, or two, two comments or questions, really, uh, Sukanya. One, one was the the emphasis uh, throughout on the need for strategic thinking. I mean, this is something which, uh, in one sense, no one is going to disagree with, uh, and it's very, very important. And it clearly is something which has been missing in so many of these external interventions we've been engaged in. But I'm trying to locate a little bit from your work. Uh, where is the strategic thinking that needs to be done that you're thinking about? Is it within, because your case study approach is through a single peace building organization. So that's one thing. Um, but that is also the broader picture. And that really brings me to the other question I wanted to ask or just put to you really, 
what I said I thought was really, really interesting and attractive with this is that you say, in spite of all we've heard about the problems of technocratic peace building, without going into further definition, you suggest there is immense potential, even within that framework, um, for, for, for transformative action. But I wonder whether that needs to be qualified. Are you qualifying? You have two case studies, Sierra Leone and Macedonia. Are you still talking about cases where there is, if not a, a deep uh, and solid political settlement, then at least a measure of, of acceptance uh, or about the future looking brighter than the recent past, where the ambient levels of violence perhaps are relatively low and where the security dilemmas are less acute than they are elsewhere. I suppose, in other words, I'm suggesting, do your findings, are they easily transferable and applicable to parts of the Democratic Republic of Congo today, or parts of Southern Sudan? Yeah. Um, I just wonder, I'm not saying there might well be, but you see what I'm trying to get yeah. at, because we are talking about the broader political picture, and what we often say is that both peacekeeping and peace building is very difficult to do in a political vacuum and always will be. Um, but whether this suggests that you're somewhere along the way and then there is a potential for, for maximizing it, but you don't have to answer it straight away, but I just wanted to, to plant that there and you can answer that as well. Okay, opening up for uh, other questions and uh, the very good invitation from Funde to uh, colleagues on our African leadership program. Who wants to start? Yes. Just, just get the microphone and we'll, and if you can introduce yourself, that would be terrific. Thank you. How are you? My name is Lucy Mapiwa. I'm from Zimbabwe, Matebele Land. My question that I would like to ask is on the conceptual framework that you are bringing forward for peace building. I would like to ask the suitability of this framework as a model. Can we apply the framework, are we saying, is it a general framework that we can apply in all parts of the world to achieve this peace building? Is there room for the framework to work in Zimbabwe or DRC as it is working in other places where you have been doing your research? Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to have a go? Yeah. yeah. I think I'm going to link up with the points that um, Matt has raised. Thank you so much for that question. Yeah. It does make me reflect on some of these findings a bit more carefully. The first thing, you know, the question about strategic thinking. I think the way in which you, know, you can pitch it at various levels, strategic, strategic thinking within the UN, for example, you know, and the way they are funding through the big peace building fund, all these various projects, and now there's an emphasis on women, peace and security, on new mm -hmm. peace and security, very formulaic approaches to doing things within particular sectors. So strategic thinking, obviously, in terms of the bigger picture of peace building, those who are funding peace building, because my reflection is through this single peace building organization is almost representative of the kind of work that various NGOs are doing in countries recovering from conflict. So it's, it's stereotypical in the way that peace building is done. And therefore strategic thinking, both in part, on, on part of the United Nations and donors who are funding projects, because the level at which I engage this is implementation. Who are the organizations that go about implementing peace building or doing peace building in the field. And strategic thinking I meant in terms of these organizations, but I think also links to donors and the funders of these projects, because unless they have a certain strategy as to what they're going to fund, how they're going to fund it, what sort of mechanisms, multi-year projects, focusing on you know, the same area for many years so that there is a long-term legacy. I think strategic thinking both at that, that level and at the level of the various organizations which implement projects. So those are the two levels I was thinking. I hope that answers your question. And then uh, you said about transformation, transformative action, and whether you can um, have, and, and that's your question as well, You know, can we apply this kind of a peace building legacy framework to any country, right? Any country which is stable, which has had conflict. I think the political settlement question is a really important one. My kind of model will apply better to countries where there is a political settlement, where there is a certain level of you know, peace to keep, mm -hmm. and there is this real push towards transforming relationships, mm -hmm. whether it's intergroup relations or whether it's intergenerational relations. So it would probably be way down the road in terms of DRC and South Sudan, mm -hmm. not quite yet, because we don't have the stability mm -hmm. in terms of peace building engagement. 
Um, but in terms of whether it would apply to Zimbabwe, I think it's almost, you know, it, it, if, if national governments want to apply this kind of thinking, it would work, but it would mean that they are investing in livelihoods, employment, in you know, all those areas which build peace regardless of whether there's active conflicts or not. Mm -hmm. So even in, in countries which have had a long conflict and are stable, both international organizations and national governments can apply a legacy lens to their work because there is not enough reflection even within national entities as to the work that is done, particularly for young people. Um, there's not enough institutionalization, not enough learning. And I think that's the value of this framework that it can be transferable, not only to youth projects, but to any other category of beneficiaries and the work that is being done with them. Do you want to comment on one of those things? No, no, I, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think that's right, but this is where actually there's a slight nuance between what organizations can do and what gov governments can do. And, and, and there's one thing I didn't respond to extensively, which is also what Sukanya mentions about education. Uh, because over time, it, this is one area where I think it is possible to have a framework that you know, really intervenes in the area of education consistently over a long period of time, even when um, conditions are not necessarily ripe for for you to do this uh, relationship, the transforming of, of relations. And that's an area that has not actually been um, sufficiently adapted because it's one thing for you to intervene and do so-called peace education. It's not that it's another thing for you uh, to intervene because there's a framework uh, that you know, you're, you're introducing around, not just changing mindsets around uh, if you like the perspectives that you offer to young people in schools, in different places, the mosaic uh, that uh, you were talking about, it, it could, in, the, in an ideal situation, help us from a very young age and take us that far. What I see, though, um, and I think it, it's important to put this on the table in education, this is where there's a contradiction between what organizations are able to offer and what governments offer. Because in some of the very countries that we're talking about, the door is shut completely for peace building education. Mm -hmm. When a country tells you, you cannot study history and you cannot study conflict or security as part of the curriculum in schools. And this is what we've seen almost across the board. I think there are one or two exceptions. So if you're from Nigeria, you're from South Africa, you're from the DRC uh, or Sudan, but you cannot study the very things that you have experienced over this period of, you know, of time in order to learn lessons from it. Where is room for organizations like this to intervene at all? Mm -hmm. So organizations like this can shape curriculum uh, and if governments just open the window for it or the international community you know, allows this to, to be carried out, then you can begin to make impact. But actually the door is shut when there's no room to intervene at all through curriculum. Senia, introduce yourself, Senia, so we know you, but not everyone. Sure. Hi everyone, I am uh, Ksenia Oksamwitna. I'm a lecturer at uh, City University uh, of London and I'm a visiting research fellow in Conflict Security and Development Research Group. So Kanye, first of all, congratulations Thank on you. the book. Um, and I'm going to ask um, a question about your cases. Mm -hmm. um, so I can imagine that you haven't selected those cases on the basis of variation mm -hmm. because you have co compared different implementation processes yes. in these two situations. So mm -hmm. I'm sympathetic to that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think there is a lot of interest in variation. Um, there is variation in terms of the sectors, mm -hmm. right? You have early childhood education and community radio. There is variation in terms of the type of conflict sort of low level tensions, conflict in Macedonia mm -hmm. and a very brutal civil war in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. There is regional variation. You've mentioned that Macedonia could access EU financing and various integration uh, mm -hmm. instruments. While in Sierra Leone, I guess the UN was the major player and funder. So what does this variation tell us about peace building in various contexts? Very good question. Go for it, yeah, go ahead, Shepan. Senia, thank you so much. Um, I think in terms of variation, partly methodologically, you know, I was quite tied into the longitudinal data that I was seeking to um, get access to. 
And in having a more in-depth study, I focused on a single organization's work over 15 years in each country, which meant that clearly it will not apply, you know, in terms of, um, it's not scientific in terms of the cases that I've selected. That, that I, was, I was tied to the data that I wanted to look at. But actually, in terms of variation, now that you raise the question, it's a really important thing to think about. Within these countries, for example, with education, I did find that depending on the organization that was doing this kind of work, for example, in peace education, there was not only really not enough interorganizational cooperation, you know, a lot of competition rather for funds, but um, often the learning strategies, and that's one of the chapters in the book, that the learning strategies between organizations can be very different. I was actually working with an organization which had a very explicit commitment to learning, which meant that at a micro level in terms of implementation, in terms of their work with the government, in terms of you know, what they were doing um, from an evaluation standpoint, you know, this was far advanced compared to other organizations. And even in terms of the national organizations, there's often a complete lacune of, of uh, doing this kind of learning. This is one area where I found that it depends very much on the type of organization doing, but also the funds, because the meta-ethnography kind of um, brought to the fore the fact that different donors wanted different things. And often organizations are like clowns, you know, they're putting on different hats and doing all these different things without any thinking about the long-term effects, which means that donors also have a really big say, you know, whether it's the EU, whether it's the UN, in terms of what is being implemented. I have this example of HIV AIDS, the fact that in Sierra Leone, less than 2% of the population was infected. But this was a big push for donors and they wanted to put money into it. Similarly, um, violent extremism. You know, recently there's been a lot of money from the UN going into countering violent extremism mm -hmm. and in countries in West Africa where this is not a problem. In fact, you know, young people now find that you know, if they start this some sort of jihadist movement, they will get benef you know, benefits in terms of being uh, asked by the government or civil society mm -hmm. to be rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. And in, all of us have done work on ex-combat and reintegration. Um, we know very well that these kinds of programs, uh, the beneficiaries want to join because of the cash benefits or the programmatic benefits in terms of you know, training or education or catch up, vocational training or whatever. And therefore, yes, variation in terms of the conditionalities being put forward by the various actors, whether they are the donors, the type of organization. So this did come through and it's there in the book. Was, yes, go ahead. You can introduce yourself at the great one. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Mirza, I'm from Afghanistan, and uh, I'm very happy to see this uh, event. Um, unfortunately, in our country, uh, around 50 years, the majority uh, people who are fighting, they are teenager, they are the youngs. Um, because strategy, uh, uh, academically and also practically, uh, uh, difference networks they they work on these youngs to be in the fight uh, for many decades. My question is that uh, those areas that the children and youngs they don't access to the radios and also. Uh, to the academic uh, or institutions or schools. So what will be the future of that? And uh, do you think uh, also we need uh, uh, peace, uh, peace, political peace building uh, work in the world? Because unfortunately in more uh, areas we have uh, political supporters for uh, this kind of bad situations that in the country, the worries, for example, in this country that the, the, in, the security is not good. Politically, uh, uh, there are the supporters to the situation be remain like this. What shall we do for the peace building or message about the uh, peace building for those political leaders, those political networks that they want to do something and they want to remind these youngs uh, in the dark future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the question. I think that's an important point you raise, the fact that of access, and it's something that I tackle in the book, the fact that 
these building programs have a finite reach, um, particularly with the mosaic case study, I demonstrate with uh, statistics that, you know, with numbers that in the end, it's maybe a thousand children or 1200 children over 15 years who've been able to access that model, the mosaic intercultural education model. So which means that other people are not accessing these norms. So how can we really talk about, um, you know, transformation across society? But there are multiplier effects in the sense that these families, you know, it's not just the children, it's their families. And through the children, the families were also exposed to these norms. So there, are, there is a certain element of multiplic multiplier effects. The other thing is, there are parallel projects happening. So if it's not Mosaic, the Nansen Dialogue Center and other UNICEF and other organizations tend to target with similar programs. And this has also happened in Sierra Leone and in every other country that we have had long-term liberal peace building. So there is invariably an exposure to liberal norms, particularly in these case studies, you know, the more post-Cold War countries where we had really deep intervention, so to speak, whether it's in the Balkans or in West Africa. So there is not a normative void. There's obviously certain values which exist in society, but the liberal values also are transmitted both through national, non-governmental, UN, you know, various actors um, working in tandem. So, so there is invariably, act, you know, even if they are not actively accessing a project, the norms exist. And in terms of radio, you know, there are other you know, social media, for example, there's so much research now on how it's phones and social media and WhatsApp and Twitter which has become a big influencer, even if radio is, you know, not being accessed. So I think these are not normative voids. That invariably, these liberal norms, even in Afghanistan, women's empowerment, women's rights, you know, is a great success story. And it's acknowledged widely. And that's because of the work being happening in tandem, not by only one organization, multiple organizations. So that's one thing. The second point is in terms of political uh, peace building. And I think this actually links to what Matt was saying about political settlements, the fact, do you have a peace to keep? Do you have a national um, you know, sort of settlement where uh, there's stability? And in, in the Sierra Leone case, you know, political mobilization mm. into electoral violence is one of the key wins of peace building because every election we've seen a decline in terms of young people being thugs or you know, being mobilized as, as election mafia, so to speak. And that's because of the sensitization and the norm transmission around not to be engaged in electoral violence. The democracy is not about um, you know, mob violence, it's about taking part and exercising your right. So I think there are definite success stories uh, which come through in the book and through this data, and I hope I answered your question. Can, can, can I add something there quickly? It, it's, there's a double-edged sword, you know, approach to, uh, to, to neoliberal, uh, or even to say, even the whole idea of liberalization politically. Because more often than not, and let me talk about the African context I'm sure of. This has been, you refer, you referenced that to Kenya. It's been so instrumentalized that what it does is that it creates, you know, uh, a group, a generation of young people who begin to lack trust in a system. And as a matter of fact, I can give examples of, you know, uh, several parts of West Africa, including Nigeria, that I'm very familiar with, that this point that Sukanya makes about electoral violence, uh, reduction in electoral violence amongst young people, it's it's not because they believe in those, in the liberal norms, the liberal order, it's because they have become more self-interested, that they will not die anymore for, you know, for politicians who behave in particular ways. And I think that's where there is no peace building or global dialogue around the dismantling of the very norms uh, or the instrumentalization of, of the norms itself. And this is where I think what you started with, Matt, about, uh, you know, the general complaints, you know, the plethora of, you know, rejection of, of um of peace building, you know, of this global peace building approach. That's actually the thing that we need to really deal with. Yes, and then, yeah, go on my list. Like, maybe I'll take two questions and then we'll go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm Michelle Hughes. I'm a PhD candidate over at the LSE in law. 
uh, actually studying the intersection between international human rights and the art of war as practiced by Western liberal democracies. And over the last 40 years, I've worked in about 24 different conflict countries, including Liberia in 2008. So we may have crossed paths. Mm -hmm. um, I am really intrigued by your research on media programs in Sierra Leone. This is one of my case studies, focusing more on Afghanistan, but uh, on the larger issue generally. And I wondered if in your research, you found any correlation between media performance during the conflict um, and media performance during the peace. Uh, and if that made a difference to the effectiveness of the media's message um, and related to that is how much donor capacity building do you think um, of professional media is required in order to help the media become a real instrument of peace building? Thank you. And by the way, I look forward to reading your book. Thank you. Sir. I'll, I'll take uh few more questions and you can just uh, yes, think about your yes. answers. <laughs> I think the song behind. Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Catherine Charles. I'm from South Sudan. Um, uh, in terms of programming and connecting it to your point of strategic thinking, uh, do you think that involving local NGOs uh, to design program, to design peace building program is important? Because um, one of the key things that where I'm coming from, most local NGOs, they are like a lock frame uh, organization and they just are uh, where the design of the peace building program, it happens somewhere else and it doesn't resonate with the context. And that's where the funding, the competition aspect, because everyone just wants to tick a box to do something, not because it resonates with the context. And then you mentioned something about how do we uh, link it um, with the institution, with the government institution. Again, I will link it back as someone that is from civil society background. Uh, in South Sudan at the moment, the civic space kind of open in a very dynamic way, whereby there's a lot of um, collaboration between the civil uh, between the civil society and the government. But then again, it will come it will come down to funding, and then a donor will be more comfortable to fund it in a particular aspect, which is not really crucial at the time that the citizens really need. So we ended up in a way that just ticking a box rather than making any impact. So yeah, thank you. I think why don't you why don't you uh, answer those <laughs> those important questions and I'll take the other ones uh, immediately after that. And Anna, you have some from okay. yeah excellent. Okay, why don't you answer that? Yes. And, um, and your question first. Um, thank you so much for that about media and peace building. I think this is really an important area and probably there's already some writing now which engages directly with um, peace media. Well, in, in these two case studies, I did not focus um, on comparing between what was happening in the conflict because radio was also used, for example, to disarm and demobilize. And mm -hmm. I do have these stories about how effective it was and um, this NGO went in and you know, they were talking to the warlords and the IUF and you know, how, that, um, how that transpired in terms of helping people demobilize and gain their trust so that was the closest I went to in terms of how it was being used in the conflict, like towards the end of the conflict. But during the peace building phase, which is uh, the focus that I have here, the interesting elements which come out from the Sierra Leone case study, um, I know you're looking at another case, Afghanistan, but the interesting thing is that how the norms, you know, whether it's accountability, whether it's government, um, governance, whether it's anti-corruption, children's rights, women's rights, these were really defined for the country. This uh, links to your question on South Sudan, that there was not really any reflection of what was required by local societies at that time. It was about this top-down push that, you know, these themes need, you know, people need to be sensitized. There's this fantastic paper by Catherine Bolton, who's at Notre Dame, and she writes about, you know, sensitization and this entire thing about radio sensitization. It plays out in terms of, you know, preaching. In the end that, you know, people, if they're told often enough, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, this is the way to behave. They actually start believing that this is the way to behave. Um, and in terms of long-term impact, capacity building actually is a big problem because community radio invariably is something which is 
locally financed. Um, you know, it's very self-help kind of model. In countries like Sierra Leone, where people are struggling to get, you know, a square meal a day still, and things are really difficult. It's, it's amazing that every evaluation talks about the fact that community radio will not survive when these NGOs leave, but they have. And that is the big win in terms of, you know, local capacity that even with minimum resources, that they are able to retain what is good. And community radio is one of those powerful uh, educational tools and also information tools, you know, reliable information. I'm not saying that it's all rosy. There are problems which I do highlight in the book. But overall, I think that, you know, in terms of capacity building, donors don't do enough. It's very short term and then they leave and then the media sector becomes quite corrupt. And, you know, there's this, um, I forget the term that I use there, but in Sierra Leone, there's this, you know, corruption of the media that the politicians will buy, you know, a more positive image for themselves by, uh, you know, small tokens of food and, you know, buying a meal or things like that for journalists. So gombo or something, we call it, it's there. So that's one thing. The other thing is about uh, strategic thinking and involving local NGOs. There is a whole lot of effort now. And, you know, this entire local turn, in fact, Roger McGinty, good friend, mentor, writes so much in Oliver Richmond. They, they talk about the local term, even Roger's new book on everyday peace, for example, cited in um, the UN General Assembly or something during the recent um, meetings is that there is a real recognition that of the power of the local. There's a real recognition. But what I think is important is that there's also a certain element of ownership and commitment on part of national governments. And I think that's the missing link because historically the way liberal peace building has played out is that they've always bypassed the national government, tried to build civil society and given money directly to civil society to have these external norms being pushed into these countries. But in weakening state uh, you know, involvement or not involving institutions, national institutions, government sufficiently has meant that succession and legacy is a problem. There has to be, you know, that the strategic thinking lies in engaging with national institutions and creating that commitment early on. The donor funding is not just, you know, that we pay for things and have a nice time and you know, that's it. It's about that commitment, that intention that we do this for so many years and then the government takes over and there's a certain space in terms of locally defining and nationally defining what will carry on you know, after donors exist. I think that is not sufficiently uh, you know, being engaged with and it's an important area of investment for donors and also for national governments because I think there's a tendency to have um, a great deal of, uh, what do you call it, donor dependency. Sierra Leone is a great case and you know, South Sudan for many, many years, whether it's humanitarian aid or you know, donor funding, there's not enough national accountability for taking over and, you know, and carrying on this work in a way which is sustainable. And I think that needs to be really sort of driven home. Raul, Nehema, and then uh, and you have questions. Thank you. You already stole half my question that was going to refer to Everyday Peace by Roger Majin, because I actually read it <clears throat> last month. But there's like a big tension question that I think that your book reflects, but it's not only by what you have told us, but it's not only, I think of you, Roger, it's like the whole stream of studies after post-conflict, that is this tension of criticizing was as was Matt saying at the beginning. My name is Raul and PhD student. There is a tension of the technocratic peace approach, and at some point when I read Roger, he's kind of he's pushing forward for this, but he's cautious to say like this is a solution to the technocratic problem. Like, yeah, you can go to the local. There is the ownership problem that we always see each each one of the cases, and and I see by what you're presenting, that you have this tension. Like, you see the positive cases, you see the, su the successes, but also you see all the problems in the middle. And there's, like, this wanting from the people that do conflict or peace research to really make something policy-oriented and solve the world because we want it. But at the same point, we understand the limitations. So my question is, what is your view on technocratic peace building after being in checking these cases and you already do on other cases like 
you're leaning towards optimistic, you're leaning towards pessimistic, is are these as as with the same Roger and I would say, like these islands of peace in the middle of, of so much things that you're that are going on. Thanks, Raul. Um, you want to take do you want to oh, answer it away? I'll take the other two. Gemma. Yeah, Gemma and then um, um thank you very much. Gemma Coyante Salador, Cranford University. Um quick question, Sukanya. You've mentioned a couple of times the need to revisit the theories of change. In your from your point of view, how should they be revisited? And do you want to read out that question we have from the uh... yeah. Thanks. This is one from Zoom. Um, so to what extent can lessons from peace and security building in the developing world be applied to Ukraine? Easy one to finish. <laughs> yeah. right. Great. And I'll, I'll, we'll do those and I'll come back to it. We have the time for another round. Yeah, good. Right. Excellent. Um, thanks, Raul. It's an interesting one that am I optimistic or pessimistic? I think I'm trying to be pragmatic. And Cedric de Conning, for example, he's written this excellent paper in International Affairs on adaptive peace building. And one of the things that he refers to and a few others about pragmatic uh, approaches to peace building. And I think that's my position. What can we do with what exists? Because there's no point having this utopian view that you know, things can be radically changed. There is no radical change in this world. It's gradual and um, there are many obstacles towards change. And in that sense, there are, what I want to highlight through this book is the opportunities that, that exist. And I think Matt has raised this point already. I'm not sure I did answer it fully. But there are opportunities within technocratic peace building that the way we do peace building, not all of it is rubbish. There are huge positives, short-term benefits. You know, if you go and speak to communities, and I've been very fortunate to be able to work at the community level in many countries, that there are huge benefits of peace building work. But often the benefits are lost because of the way we are doing it, because of this drop in ocean effects, because of not enough follow-up, because of not enough sustained engagement in certain areas. And that if we perhaps tweak the way in which we do peace building, even if it, you know, even if it is within, within the straight jacket of liberal peace building, that we can have much more uh, long-term change or transformation. And, and that, that is the point I really want to highlight. Emma's point about theory of change, and this really directly engages with some of the evaluative data. Um, through the archival ethnography that I was doing, you know, various projects that, you know, multiple year projects that they had, whether it was radio, whether it was peace education, often the evaluation data actually was spot on in terms of picking up what the weaknesses were, the lack of normal resonance in Macedonia, right? The need for um, capacity building with media. The bigger questions that you arrive at 15 years later have actually been raised even two or three years into the life cycle of these projects, which means that there is not enough internalization or action to make the changes that is required to various theories of change to various uh, project uh, design or programming design. And therefore, it's not that the, you know, the, the evaluative ex uh, Evidence does not exist. It, it, it does exist. And evaluators are often impartial and quite brutal in saying what needs to be changed. But very rarely is that action, the response in terms of, you know, we will make that change. It's often like, yes, it's too much work. Let's just forget about it and continue what we're doing. And we have the donor money, so let's just keep doing the other things that we need to do. It's just busyness, this everyday busyness of doing peace building and showing performance rather than actually taking a step back and thinking, like, what do we need to fix? Why is this not really working? I think that's not, um, that's mm -hmm. what I meant. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of Ukraine, I am no specialist on Ukraine. I do not want to open a can of worms, but I think that's, it's a different sort of conflict. It's an interstate conflict. It's uh, an attack, uh, you know, in terms of state sovereignty. And some of the countries that I'm looking at very much are civil conflicts, which are intergenerational, intergroup, uh, you know, relations need to be transformed because of the internal, uh, you know, fissures and fractures. So I think some of these lessons may not apply as closely. So can, can I can I be a little bit provocative uh, on Ukraine? Uh, and I think you're right. Some of these conflicts we're talking about are internal, 
that became internationalized in different ways, in the very way that Ukraine itself uh, has become. And I think Ukraine is suffering from exactly the same kind of challenge that we've seen uh, in those internal contexts. I remember in the case of Sierra Leone, how for a long time the RUF was seen as fundamentally evil, right? And in fact, around some of our, our closed door meetings or in task force meetings, the questions of the question of who are the good guys would arise, okay? But actually to the ordinary Sierra Leoneans, so the ordinary West Africans have suffered at the hands of these rebel groups. At some point in time, the debate was whether, whether you should make peace, whether actually it's about brokering peace, uh, if you removed morality from it. And today we see a Ukraine where the United Nations is completely unable to broker peace because it's split between the notions of good or bad, or they are on this side or on the side of the other. So in terms of the strategic approach to making peace and doing that on the basis of the so-called neutrality on behalf of the people, it's just that the difference is that Ukraine and entire country and all its citizens are the, you know, are the receiving end of a contested power dynamic. In the same way that in Sierra Leone, those ordinary citizens were the receiving end of a contested power dynamic internally. Um, and I just think that the whole question of peace is so little researched that, you know, how to, how to make it, how to build it is not something that we have politically aligned ourselves around with, you know, by being neutral on behalf of people who suffer before talking about goodness or badness or whether people are on one side or the other. I just wanted to really reflect on it like that. I thought that was a really challenging, very good question. Very, very good question. But I don't think uh, I can answer it either. I just wanted to offer those thoughts. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Congratulations. My name is Esther. Um, you, you're going to get the... Congratulations again on the book and the hard work that you've done. Um, I hope I can get a copy. Uh, by a copy. Sure. So, my, you were very quick to, uh, upon the challenge from Mart to run away from the applica applicability of your, your theory, your legacy in peace building in, in South Sudan. But I think South Sudan is an interesting. Um, is an interesting focus, especially for this, because there was a settlement, there was a political settlement, there was independence, there was celebration of that. And there was a period before things reverted um, into or took a different shape. And perhaps could it be that the lack of a succession plan, the lack of, you know, figuring out who goes on to do what once all these peacekeepers who've been here for years leave? Because what your work has done simply means that if we are to focus on that, then we probably will not have South Sudan happening again. There would be countries that may have that political settlement, but it could be fragile or there could be environments that are created to take people back and we're studying in, in, in the MSC, global leadership and peace building, that sometimes conflicts are actually meant not to end so that it, there could have been a reason that the conflict in South Sudan was beneficial to some people and continuing with peace building and, and state building went against the economic, uh, you know, uh, aspects of of what was happening in the state i wouldn't know but i think you shouldn't run away from, from south sudan so quickly mm -hmm. because there is there could be room to apply what you have learned through the spirit what you have learned through through the spirit and through all that work to certain uh, situations and say how do we not get another south sudan happening again uh, that, that's a, that's a fantastic way to think about it, and and thank you for you know sort of pushing me to think a bit harder. 
Um, actually, the framework on inter intergenerational peace, you know, which is a project that I take up next year um, uh, from April, I've been really fortunate to get funding for it. Um, this is a very pertinent one uh, for South Sudan because South Sudan has been such a long drawn conflict and there has not been enough generational turnover in terms of the political um, leadership. And one of the projects that I take on, I actually not run away from South Sudan. I have a, it is a case study in something that I'm writing next. Um, the SPLMA and the dynamics of leadership turnover or the lack of it, and also the legacies of a guerrilla movement now becoming a political party, but the political party angle is completely underdeveloped and it has become this authoritarian um, setup, a military rule, so to speak which means that there are really, you know, in terms of South Sudan, it's not so much just political settlement or the lack of it or, or weak settlement. I think it is actually the transformation of the SPLMA, which is a problem and linking it somewhat to the relationship between civilian communities and the guerrilla movement, because those legacies have continued in the post uh, in the 2011 sort of period. And this is a really important relationship to look at. It's that peace, the actors who can implement the peace, the spoilers who can spoil the peace. And in so many ways, the government itself is a spoiler and a fragmented spoiler. And I think in South Sudan, the legacy angle is slightly different. It's about transformation of um, the guerrilla character of SPLMA into a political entity, which is trustworthy, which engages with communities in, a, in, in, in the form of a state with a contract to deliver services and security. I think that is a big problem rather than just thinking about, you know, peace building and what happens after. Did you get the last uh, question, I think? So it better be a good one. <laughs> um, thanks. And thanks for the talk. It's fascinating. And I'll, I'll get a copy and, and try and read through it. So Peter, I work at the Foreign Office on conflict. Um, I'm going to be cheeky and ask two, a small one and a big one. Mm -hmm. So the small one was, you mentioned something, I think, about norms being instrumentalized. And I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about that and how they were instrumentalized, I think, by, by some of the actors on the ground. And the second one is, you mentioned um, there's a need more to work with national governments. And of course, speaking from the perspective of a donor, um, we do pump billions into, well, not the UK, as an international community, mm -hmm. billions into education programs delivering through governments. Um, but of course, that comes from a very, usually a very different funding stream. And there's, a, there's an education department and an education team, and they fund global education funds like the Girls' Education Challenge Fund and Education in Emergencies and so on. So if you were... Put in front of one of those teams and the um and the question was they were saying we want to better program so that we can support peace building and given their priorities tend to be achieving scale and generally they won't touch curriculum because that's a sovereign issue what would you say their priorities should be and what, what advice would you give them thank you Peter. um now the first thing about norms being instrumentalized i think Beneficiaries, and then going back to the work that I've done on ex-combatant reintegration, which in so many ways motivated this project. Beneficiaries in, in a country which is economically unstable, where there are limited opportunities for work, for decent work, for livelihoods, for sustainable livelihoods, tend to look at peace building as you know, a form of um, just that benefit. So when you talk to communities, it's often like it's not the nature of the program, it's the benefits that come with the program, which is more important. And therefore, often there is a certain buy-in to various projects, not because they resonate with their own local values or the way they think, for example, you know, women's empowerment. In, in, in parts of Sierra Leone, women don't own land. You know, they can't stand you know, for elections as chiefs and things like that. So inherently, the society does not agree with issues of empowerment. But there's a certain buy-in from various sectors. Women, because they want to have those access to those rights, which traditionally they've not had. And also national governments, because you know, they want to transform into these progressive governments that are you know, willing to change things in, in terms of participation and representation. So there's instrumentalization at various levels in terms of communities, in terms of beneficiaries, in terms of governments. 
that's one thing. Second thing is about um, if I were consultant, and you know, I'm looking forward to the job, buddy. Um, <laughs> if I were consultant for DFID or FCDO, and they were asking me to talk to their various teams who work in education, I think often there's and one of the points I think uh, which Funmi has raised about incoherence, the drop in ocean effect, the fact that these different programs don't talk to each other. You might have a fantastic program being run by a local NGO or a national NGO or an international NGO doing similar sort of work, but they have, you know, they just don't speak to each other. In some ways, academic departments are also like that. <laughs> but uh, the funny thing is that it's not just about scale curriculum. It's about implementing for effect in a way that there is coordination between activities, right? So there's coordination between um, organizations, for example, that are working with girls' education and organizations which are working with secondary education. Now, how do you align those activities so that they kind of converge towards the same, delivering the same in effect? And I think that is a great weakness. And anybody who's done field work for many years in different countries would know that organizations are often duplicating effects. You know, that their programs are doing the same thing, often in the same communities, but they don't speak to each other. And that is the basic, you know, requirement that we that we are aware, you know, that, that we acknowledge that there is value in the work being done by other organizations, and that we can actually engage in a positive way and try to have that kind of strategic alignment. That you know, if you're doing women's education or girls' education, we are doing young people, and actually we are trying to do the similar sort of thing in terms of access or school dropout rates and things like that. That's really important. Terrific. Well, I think we are running out of time. Um, it's been a, a, a wonderful um, hour and a half, uh, really, really enriching and lots of food for thought. Um, and it remains for me to, first of all, say that everyone is welcome to stay on a bit longer. I think we have lots of wine to finish. Or <laughs> Not enough people. And a bit of food. But above all, to thank uh, Sukhane so much for coming along to share your thoughts with us. I'm sure people will now buy a book. And also, of course, the Funmi for being so good at turning up and giving us some very, very good yes. uh, feedback on that. Uh, I know we know how busy you are. So please join me, everyone, in thanking our speakers. Great. <laughs>